Hi, good morning, everybody. Welcome to episode 15 in our What If interview series, um, where we share and discuss um, topics and knowledge around customer experience, digital transformation, and how to better serve customers via your digital channels. So for those who haven't joined us before, my name's Tracy Greer. I'm the head of marketing for Mando. Um, and again, for those who, who don't know us, we're a digital agency committed to simplifying digital experiences for everyone. So we work within um, the regulated industry sector with companies like utilities and financial services. And we focus on helping your customers to do those tasks that they really don't want to do. So I'm sure we don't all wake up on a Saturday morning super excited about paying our water bill or having to submit an insurance claim. So we like to make these experiences easier, giving customers time back to do the more exciting things with their lives. So today our title is, what if your customers only had to click once to find what they're looking for? And we welcome our guest, Adam Friday, UX lead at Mando. So Adam's got 12 years experience in the industry, working for leading automotive manufacturers, charities and e-commerce businesses. And more recently, he specialised in the area of UX and content for regulated industries here at Mando. So before we get started, just to let you all know, we've also got my other Mando colleague, Luke, on the call with us too. So Luke's going to be helping with logistics and monitoring the chat. So if you've got any questions or comments, please just be sure to pop them in the windows there. And Luke can uh, come back on screen and ask them at the end of the discussion. We'll chat for around 20 to 25 minutes. And then we'll move on to any questions or comments at the end. So um, we'll start out by saying welcome to Adam. Um, if you can introduce yourself, just give us a bit of detail about your background um, and tell us a bit more about what you do at Mando. Okay, thanks, Tracy. So um, my name's Adam Friday. I'm Lead UX and Content. I actually started in graphic design at university before moving into digital. And my first job was designing TV user interfaces for set-top boxes. I've since moved around digital quite a bit. I've worked for automotive, television, finance, uh, different charities, um, and as Tracy alluded to, more recently in the regulated industry spaces. Um, my main role is to increase customer engagement through enhanced customer experiences, um, but with that, solving business problems at the same time. You can't solve one without considering the other. Um, that's pretty much what I do. That's great. Thanks, Adam. That gives everybody a good idea of, of your background and where you've come from. Um, so we'll get on to today's topic area um, and just, just discussing that in a bit more detail. So um, the realms of digital technology and best practice for websites is you know, always rapidly changing. Um, and just in the last few years, there have been multiple events that have accelerated these changes. Um, just up until now, though, kind of excluding the last six to 12 months, but up until up until then, kind of the previous couple of years before that, if you can just let us know what you would say has been the traditional setup for a website. OK, uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think any website is set up with bad intentions um, and I don't think there's a traditional setup per se, but there are very, very common themes that most sites have that you come across. Um, they're all built, for the, the largest proportion of them, are built on the assumption that you need to search and browse to, what you, to find what you're looking for. Meaning that most sites are of a certain size where searching and browsing is necessary. And I don't think that assumption has been challenged near enough, uh, for the most part. Uh, if, we, if we think about what you see on a website, if we ask anyone to think about what they see on a website, they're very likely to describe similar things menu, hero, search, um, promotional cards, maybe homepage takeover for notifications. They're all very similar components that we've seen and heard about and we're quite familiar with. Um, but the problem with that is because that's the norm, those traditions and those paradigms of navigation just get carried on and carried over without being challenged. Um, so we start to see the creation of pages that aren't really supporting an overarching customer need. They're, you, you, you hear about about sections or news sections, and it's almost taken as a given that those things need to exist. And very often we find that there are no goals associated with much of that content. Um, and we want content to be structured along a single customer journey. 
that overarching customer journey. Digital needs to be supporting that. So um, I would say a lot of websites, in summary, a lot of websites are a lot bigger than they need to be and aren't challenging enough those, those familiar paradigms that have just become normal. Exactly, yeah. So you're saying a, a lot of the structure is based around habit and what's always Completely. been done rather yeah. than looking at why it's put together in that way. Great. So you, you've obviously said that there there is a general structure that seems to seems to be um, you know followed by by most websites. Um, have you got any kind of ideas or insight into what the thought process was behind that originally? Well, I, I think it's I think it's path of least resistance for a lot of businesses. They want to get something in place that's accessible. Um, certainly within the regulated industry space. So if you see a website with similar features or competitors or comparative brands that you might hold yourself against, you, you to see yourselves reflected in those brands or have uh, similar functionalities can be quite comforting because you feel like you're on par with them. The problem is because we love baselining ourselves against what others are doing, we very often lose out on the ability to go, what aren't they doing? And what is that gap that we can fill to do something completely different and be an industry leader as opposed to part of the industry. I think also um, a common theme that we that I see a lot is uh, digital teams are under a lot of pressure. And I know you said certainly the last 12 months, but even more so with the regulations that have been coming in and the last few years regulated industries are now being held accountable. Uh, digital teams are under a lot of pressure and very often they're dealing with stakeholders that have opinions and those opinions can sometimes supersede uh, real fact-based decisions. So I feel your pain, I feel the pain, um, and that can sometimes be uh, a deciding factor in going down this route. Um, and the result is we start to see the same website and the same type of problems over and over again because there's no real fundamental consideration of what the website needs to do to satisfy customer and business. Absolutely. So there's kind of no going back to basics to look up, just to question why, you know, it's just if you look the same as the same as your competitors with a few tweaks, then surely that's good, right? Historically. Uh, that would be the, the historical view. And uh, I like to come at things that what are they not doing and what, what are they not doing well and yeah. uh, attempting to build upon that. So what are the causes behind that, do you think, then? Uh, I think the one of, one of the largest ones would be that sites just grow. They evolve. And very often, content is added and not reviewed. Uh, and that's one of the biggest problems. We end, a lot of what we see, uh, certainly within UX and content space, is we've got 500 PDFs, as an example. That, that's a big problem. <laughs> because PDFs aren't accessible. Uh, for the most part, they're difficult to find. And depending on what uh, browser you're using, there are different methods in which that would be downloaded and viewed. This is just a very small example. But if you extrapolate that across the entire site, you might have 500 pages of content and 10% of that is being uh, visited on a really regular basis. So we have to ask yeah. ourselves, what, what is the other 90% of content doing? Um, why is that content forcing you and forcing customers to have to search and browse for what they need. Um, it, it's very hard to target customers when you've got a site that large that isn't supporting an overarching customer journey. Exactly. Um, and it, it does get to that point where the problem is so large that any small change that you make, a tactical change here and there, is a drop in the ocean. It's not considering things holistically. Absolutely. And what do you think, what, what do you see the problems or the, the kind of, you know, the impacts on businesses and customers of all of those kind of issues that you've outlined there? Uh, hopefully for the audience that, that are watching, it would be the customer satisfaction scores. If, if, if customers can't find what they're looking for, they get frustrated, they're going to have a bad experience. That's, that's the, the ultimate um, pitfall of having a site that's too large with content that isn't working well. Um, yeah. There's no sense of fulfillment due to lack, lack of uh, actionable content. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with the it's easier to call scenario. 
or I would just yeah. call. Um, and also internal frustrations. I, I, I feel the pain when, when, when we talk to clients is we understand that they're frustrated. They haven't got the site that's working the way they want it to. They want to change. Um, but certain pressures have pushed them down this route where they've got this site that's essentially snowballing out of control. Um, brand reputation can be impacted due to out, outdated, broken or ineffective content. So, and, and I think most importantly, the longer you leave it, the more expensive it becomes to change it. So the cost of business is, is extremely high. Um, it's, it's one of those situations you, you have to get on top of it because no one wins if you don't. Customer, business, employees, there's a lot of frustrations rise. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's great, thank you. I think that gives, definitely gives me a good idea of what, you know, what the issues are historically and, and you know, what needs to be changed and what needs to be fixed, which sounds like there's a lot there that needs to be tackled. Um, so we'll move on to kind of the, the last six to 12 months. I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing about COVID um and how it impacts every single area of our lives at the moment um but it is very very hard to ignore um the changes in consumer behavior and the changes in behavior of everybody really um with every aspect of our lives um and we know particularly when it comes to digital there's been a a, a huge explosion in its usage um and it's you know our reliance on digital technology over the last six to 12 months so could you just outline for me um, what you've seen when it comes to customer expectations? We know that they've changed. If you can just outline how they have changed um, and how that might affect, affect the, the businesses that are listening. I think a multitude of factors, as you've sort of um, uh, touched upon. I, I think the one thing it's taught us is that customers don't want to spend time on these websites. I, I think it's proven that in, in a couple of ways. Um, it's, it's obviously COVID's forced our hand and customers have had to uh, uh, deal with a whole host of stresses that they wouldn't normally. So it's, it's unfair to judge the entirety of digital on the last 12 months, but customers are wanting greater flexibility. They're time poorer than they ever have been. Uh, attention spans are reduced. Stress levels are extremely high. And we see that with uh, regards to the PSR type work that we do, um, we know how important it is around vulnerability and how many people would be considered vulnerable now, or, or they consider themselves vulnerable due to the last 12 months. Um, the requirement for a 24 seven digital service. Now we talk about 24 seven coverage because we have a, a website, but service is becoming the norm. People want to be served whenever. I know banking have made uh, massive inroads in that space and they have that uh, automated or online ability to communicate communicate with customers but they're expecting that relevant and timely correspondence all the time now it's it's no longer just for the um the dealing with a pandemic that's the new norm that's what customers are expecting yeah. and they will continue to expect once covid is is over Absolutely. And how, how do you see that impacting customer journeys themselves? Uh, if I could say, I don't think it has yet, or at least the effects haven't been seen yet. Um, but what I do think is we, we've seen that many businesses have put in place ways we deal with COVID and rightly so. And so some people have done it exceptionally quick. The, the turnaround times have been fantastic. Um, but, but things like automated assistance to triage, uh, inbound contacts or self-service functions in places. But if we if we take the example of COVID, let's think about how COVID-related content was presented on just regulated industry sites. I'm going to hazard a guess that 99% of those sites had some form of, let's say, homepage takeover, whether that's in the form of a notification or a banner, a quick link, um, something really identifiable upon landing. And this, in turn, would take you to a page that is dedicated to all of that rich information that you'd expect to see with actionable uh, CTAs associated with it. So a customer could come, click once, see the content that they're after, and hopefully get the answer that they're looking for. The problem is, is the rest of the content on the site is yet to be considered in the same way. 
So we've got a whole customer base that essentially pretty much everyone has been affected by. Using services related to COVID um, to get help or to notify or def to defer payments or to get support or just general information. And it's been very quick and easy to do it. And the problem is moving forward, they're going to expect that from not just the two or three COVID pages, but every single one of your pages on your website. That is a big problem because essentially what, what, it's, what it's asking of regulated industries, will your satisfaction scores drop now that customers are used to be in the center of your world, essentially? They've been treated exceptionally well during COVID. And what's your plan to mitigate that for the rest of the site? Absolutely. Like you say, it's completely raised expectations, hasn't it? Um, so if, if it's that easy to do on some areas of the site, then, you know, you wonder why there's no holistic strategy to, to then run those things across the other areas of the site as well. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so we're going to start to talk about some solutions and some of your recommendations. Um, as to how we can fix all of these issues. So, um, you know, the direction that we seem to be heading with regards to digital transformation um, and the trends of the last 12 months is going to continue, like you say, customer expectations as well as, um, you know, new technologies and things. What would you say are some of the solutions and some of the best practice that you would recommend and you would implement with our clients um, that companies can, can kind of get grips with to uh, yeah, just to better serve their customers. No, it's a good question. I, I think if you want to create great experiences, um, and by great, I don't mean flashy. Uh, I just mean experiences that really serve customers um, and yeah. get the job done. Above anything else, you have to understand your content. If you don't know what you've got, where it lives, how well it's performing, if you don't know what content you have, you can't make the most basic and fundamental decisions about the website. It's the unlock to everything. You, you cannot think of a website that doesn't contain content. It doesn't matter what website you think of, the one unifying factor is it presents content. So that should be the starting point before you even consider functionality, before you even consider journeys, before you even start considering uh, shortening customer journeys or enhancing them is what content am I going to push to the customer in these scenarios? What does the customer require? So it, it, auditing the website would be the, the biggest and uh, quickest way to uh, kickstart that process. It'd be about understanding your content and ultimately what needs to be discarded what needs to be rewritten or potentially restructured when you've got that answer you can then start to think about enhancing customer experiences okay and how would you go about doing how would you go about kind of deciding which channels and which content to actually focus on to take forward so that that that's a really interesting question i, th I think the the great thing about content is it can be pushed to any channel. So naturally, which channels do I push content to is the next question. Um, but you really need to analyze cost to serve and relate that with customer need. Um, and I know it, it's more than a UX and content question that that's much more strategic and business driven. But if you've got business requirements and you know what customers are asking for and you know what channels they're currently using, you can start to plan around, uh, plan around those channels. Um, the starting point is creating that strong foundation. And if your core digital service is not working currently, don't add more digital channels to it. Don't add additional mechanisms for your customers to contact. Uh, we want to think about what we can remove in the first instance and then start to enhance and build upon those channels that are already in place and established. Um, ultimately, the goal is to create content that is relevant, timely, uh, and in the best case scenario, one click away. Um, and it doesn't really matter what channel that happens on, as long as it's in line with what the customers need and what the business is expecting um, to do with those channels. So we've seen a lot of automation around 
uh, chatbots, um, automated assistance through messenger services, they're working very well. Um, but that's not for everyone because it's not for every customer base. So it's about understanding your customers and correlating that with content and deciding upon the best delivery mechanism for that content. That's great, thank you. Can I just ask, have you seen any particular standout examples of where it's been done really well over the last six to 12 months of where people have actually um, implemented studies where it's been done well so you just cut out there a little bit Tracy but I think I got the question um so uh, it's about real world examples have you got any that which have stood out to you yeah. and you've thought you know that's been a really great way of of either delivering that content or using a channel to the best of its ability so I would if I can use a personal example of something that I thought was great, um, I got and I received an email from my water company um, without even having to visit the website. Um, and it had links in that I could click on if I needed to. Now, I'm not in a position where I would consider myself vulnerable or uh, directly impacted in a negative way from COVID other than the, the social implications. Um, but I could understand that someone who might be uh, adverse to speaking to someone directly or uh, digitally immature or not particularly savvy, that initial point of contact was the business contacting me to say, we're here to help. Um, now, that could have been on any channel, depending on the channel of choice that you might have set up with registration or the account that you've got. Um, but I think, I think also the automated assistance on many of the regulated industry sites, um, particularly uh, around water, I think they've, they've done a, a very good job in responding extremely quickly. People are at home more, uh, they're using more water, I, I imagine, and, and, mm -hmm. and so handling that in those particular ways, I think has been exceptional. Um, but I don't think there's, I, it, would be, it would be unfair to say that someone's doing it badly because we're, on, we're in unprecedented situation where we've had to move extremely quickly in digital to accommodate. Um, but yes, I think those that do it well have had outbound campaigns uh, yeah. to reassure rather than waiting for customers to come to, uh, to their site. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously waiting for customers to, like you said previously, pick up the phone rather than trawl through the site, um, yeah. thereby causing further issues. Um, can I just talk for a, a, a few minutes about digital experience platforms? So um, obviously we work with the likes of Sitecore and EpiServer, um, now yeah. optimizely as of today. Um, so can you just maybe give us an idea of why these types of technologies and these types of experience platforms um, make kind of implementing all the solutions you've talked about, what, how it makes it easier for us and for our clients? Well, yeah, and, and let's, let's use the um, example that I talked about that outbound um, content uh, that we talked about during COVID. So, a, a decent experience platform is going to enable great experiences. It doesn't deliver them, it doesn't package them up neatly. Uh, there's a bit of consideration that goes, but they're, they're massively important tools in getting the right setup for the business. So for example, personalization modules or the right CRM integrations can give you a strong offer in terms of pushing and prompting customers when you need them to take action. Um, without a decent digital experience platform, none of that would be possible. So like the example I talked about, you don't want customers to be frustrated waiting a week um, and then contact you uh, about a certain topic after you've given them a whole week to get frustrated. If you've got the right integrations in place and the right platform, you can push the right content to the right person at the right time, mitigating a lot of that stress, a lot of that frustration. And it also means you've got to do less on your website. So. The, the experience platform is an enabler of those types of experiences. You can, you can create um, an ecosystem that works a lot harder for you 
than having to just churn out content and make your site bigger, uh, which ultimately leads to frustrated customers. Absolutely, and you touched on there about the yeah, you touched on there about the right content to the right person at the right time, and I guess it's um, particularly when you're talking about kind of multi channels as well. I guess it um, it's a good thing that you know, and these these types of experience platforms make it easier by having that single view of the customer and obviously being able to to record everything that the customer does and knowing exactly where they are on that customer journey if they're switching channels within that yeah. within that same journey then you know we know who they are you don't have to um you know re-authenticate them etc so definitely helping that way um great so can i just ask you to before we move on to some questions i just want to get you to sum up um your three key takeaways so with our webinars we like to make sure that people can step away with some uh, pragmatic suggestions practical suggestions as to how they can improve things from today um, yeah. so what would you say are your top three tips or key learnings that you think people can take away and start to action i don't think it would be three separate tips um, but it would be three related actions um, Firstly, go away and audit your content um, or get someone to help you do that. Uh, you can crawl the site with something like Screaming Frog and it will give you the basic fundamental facts about what your content is doing. Uh, URL structure, uh, SEO, uh, visits, and just, just the general core facts about what is going on with your content. The next phase is trim redundant content. Get rid of it unless it's a legal requirement or a regulatory requirement trim it and start to think about what content could take its place uh, in a much more condensed format um, and secondly uh, and thirdly sorry prioritize the area of your site that you think is causing you the most pain and get to work redesigning it in line with the principles that we've talked about if you could take one of the biggest sections of your site that you you know is causing you hassle that you know is causing your customers frustrations redesign it with the principle of one click in mind what would that look like how big would that section need to be how would you talk to customers how and and have those conversations honestly and openly with your business um in summary i'd say if, if you want to create create great experiences that are focused targeted actionable best case scenario one click i know that's not always achievable then yeah. you have to have that discussion through the lens of content. Um, you you won't be successful if you don't. Okay, perfect. That's some really great suggestions there. Thank you. Hopefully that helps our listeners there. Um, so we'll move on to some questions. I'll ask Luke to come back on to turn his camera on. There we go. Um, so Luke, have we got any questions from the audience at all? We do, two. Um, the first one being uh, earlier, Adam, you said that there's a lot of websites that have far more content on them than, than actually you know customers require are there any sort yeah. of common culprits that that muddy the waters of delivering a good experience no i think i think um the the problem is is you've got each, each each couple of years you've got a new set of targets and i would ask is the old set of targets and the content required to serve those so that you're compliant is that being reviewed the likelihood is it's not being reviewed robust enough and therefore you just start expanding and expanding and expanding. The problem is there's no real set section. If I could say, I think uh, sustainability is a huge section, but that's really important. But start thinking about, does it need to be this big? Could, 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 we, could we condense it? Is there something more action-based? And are there other channels that we can start supplying this content? Does it always need to be a web page? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not one particular area that, uh, but with the exception of PDFs, I think everyone is guilty of having far too many documents and downloads um, that are just out of date and not right and they're not up to date. Yeah, absolutely. From me. Oh, is that it? That's the one. Well, we're, we're bang on 10.30 now. So um, a couple of people have started dropping off, obviously got other meetings to go to. So um, we'll, we'll come to a close there and just say thank you very much, Adam, for joining us today. Um, really interesting discussion. Um, and thanks to Luke there for um, helping us out. Um, so yeah, 
thanks to everybody that listened. Um, have a great day and we will, shall be circulating the on-demand link over the next couple of days so that you can listen again or you can send it on to your colleagues. So thanks very much, Adam. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Have good days. Bye.